Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and today I'd like to read to you a Russian folk tale. I grew up with the myths and with all kinds of wonderful fairy tales and folk tales. And one of the books that I really loved when I was growing up was this book on the Russian fairy tales. This very book right here. I grew up with this book and I really loved its illustrations and the stories. These Russian folk tales that have been passed down from one generation to another. And I was recently on a podcast with my good friends Scott Onstott and Jeff Fitzpatrick. And they specifically wanted to talk about the figure of Lilith in ancient myth. And I brought up this image. It's an ancient image from ancient Mesopotamia. And some scholars believe it may represent Lilith. Other scholars argue that it may be the Mesopotamian goddess of the underworld. But in any case, you see these uh, bird legs that are depicted in this image. And as I was talking about that, I explained that it was reminiscent of, it made me think of in the Russian fairy tales, in Russian folk tales, there are powerful witches or a specific powerful witch. Sometimes she has two sisters as well. And they live in these huts in the woods that stand on chicken legs and the whole hut can get up and turn. The chicken legs can make the hut turn and face, <laughs> face you when you're coming up to the hut. And I pointed out that the constellation Ophiuchus, which is a very pivotal constellation and often plays the role of higher self in the system of celestial metaphor that informs ancient myths around the world. This pivotal figure of Ophiuchus can be envisioned as a hut or a house standing on two thin legs, just like a hut standing on two chicken legs. And so you can check out that conversation with my friends Scott Onstott and Jeff Fitzpatrick of the Sacred Geometry Academy, and their podcast is called Geometer's Compass. You can check out that whole conversation. But I brought up the Russian folktale that I'm going to read to you. It's called Vasilisa the Beautiful, and she has to go into the forest to meet with this powerful witch in order to try and bring back fire to her house, to her home. And this fairy tale, this Russian folk tale that goes back for centuries is very pertinent to us today, even right now in this very month of December 2021, as we're nearing the very end of 2021, it's the last few days of December 2021, this Russian folk tale or fairy tale is still very pertinent in fact, to the situation that we're facing right now. So I'd like to read to you the story of Vasilisa the Beautiful, this version from the Russian fairy tales that I grew up with as a young boy. I loved this whole book, every single story in here. <laughs> Let me find it. And I'll show you the pictures. I think it's the second one. Right after Ivan and the Firebird. Okay, here it is. Vasilisa the Beautiful. Can you see that? Once there was a rich merchant who lived happily with his wife and their daughter, Vasilisa. When the child was eight years old, her mother fell ill. She sent for her daughter and said, Dear child, I am going to die. Since I can no longer help and guide you, I want you to take this doll. Never show it to anyone, but if you are ever in danger or need help, remember the doll and ask her advice. So saying, she handed the child a tiny doll. Vasilisa hid it in her dress pocket and told no one. The merchant was saddened by the death of his wife, but at the same time, since he had to go on a very long business trip, he thought he ought to find a new mother 
to care for Vasilisa. His choice fell on a widow who had two daughters about Vasilisa's age. The woman seemed a good mother, and so, a short time later, he proposed, and they were wed. Unfortunately, his new wife was not at all as the merchant had imagined her. She made Vasilisa do the hardest chores. Her own daughters were served hand and foot like the greatest of great ladies. In spite of hard work, or perhaps because of it, Vasilisa became more and more beautiful. Many a young man longed to marry her. She was always gay, smiling, and pleasant. Yet, without her doll, Vasilisa might well have died of misery and exhaustion. For no matter how hard Vasilisa worked all day, at night there was always more work left to do. Year after year, when everyone was asleep, Vasilisa would take the doll from her apron pocket and tell it her trouble. Go to bed, my dear. Sleep, my dear, the doll would say. Then the doll would finish the work, so that every morning Vasilisa awoke to find the house in order, the stove lit, and breakfast ready. Years went by this way. The cruel stepmother never stopped looking for a way to drive Vasilisa permanently out of the house. One autumn evening, before going to bed, the evil woman tried a plan. She gave each of the three girls a task. The elder was to crochet lace. The younger was to knit. And Vasilisa, she was to spin wool. The stepmother put out all the lights in the house, leaving only a candle burning where the girls were. Then she went up to her room. Soon the candle began to smoke. One of the sisters got up and pretended to trim the wick. Instead, obeying her mother's orders, she snuffed out the candle. What shall we do, she cried. There's no fire in the house. We can't relight the candle. How will we finish our work? There's only one thing to do, said her sister, and that is to get fire from the witch in the forest. There's no one else nearby with fire to give us. I can crochet without light, said the elder, and continued working. I can knit without light, said the other, and continued working. Then both together they cried, But Vasilisa, you can't spin wool in the dark. You must go to the witch in the forest to get some fire. With that, the two sisters pushed Vasilisa out into the night and bolted the door behind her. Dear doll, said Vasilisa, crying, Dear, dear doll, I have heard terrible stories about the witch in the forest. Do not cry, Vasilisa, the doll replied. Go where your sisters have sent you, and do not be afraid. The young girl entered the forest. The night was dark and moonless. She could hardly see two steps ahead. Vasilisa trembled with fear. Suddenly she heard a noise. It came closer and closer. A horseman, all in white, rode across her path on a white horse. He disappeared into the woods, and day began to dawn. A few minutes later, she saw a red horseman on a red horse. He disappeared into the woods behind the first horseman, and the sky began to glow. Soon, the sun came up. Vasilisa was now able to see. She pressed ahead more quickly. But the way was long and the forest path overgrown with brush. She walked on and on all that day and well into the evening. Finally, she came out into a clearing. The witch's hut stood just ahead of her. It was surrounded by stakes, each crowned with a burning coal. Actually, in some versions of the story, you can find a 1916 translation of this same story online. Uh, in, in some versions, the, the fence around her hut is made of human bones, and on top of each fence post is a human skull, and the glowing is coming from the eye sockets of each of these skulls. So, returning to the version that I had when I was a child. Vasilis uh, Vasilisa looked at the hut, 
dreading the moment when she must pass between the mysterious glowing pickets. Suddenly, another horseman rode out of the woods. He was all in black, on a black horse. He galloped, pa he galloped past the witch's hut, and immediately the forest was plunged into the complete blackness of a moonless night. The hut seemed to huddle against the earth in a circle of light rimmed by long, wavering tree shadows. It was an unearthly, haunting scene. Vasilisa hesitated at the edge of the circle of light, not knowing what to do. She jumped, gasping at a loud explosion close by. There stood the forest witch, within the circle of pickets. Who has dared come here? She boomed in a powerful voice. Uh, again, in the 1916 version, she rides in in a mortar. What's a mortar? Well, there's mortar and pestle that you uh, pound the grain in. And a mortar is found in many myths around the world and is associated with specific constellations. And I've talked about that in some of my books. So, who has dared come here? She boomed in a powerful voice. I, good mother, Vasilisa answered, curtsying politely. My stepsisters sent me to ask you for fire. I know those two. Stay here a while and work for me. Afterward, I shall give you fire. She went into the hut and ordered, Girl, see what's on the stove and give me something to eat. Vasilisa looked into the pots and pans on the stove. The food was just about ready to be eaten. There was enough for ten people. She set the table as neatly as she knew how. Then she went to the cellar for cider and bread and wine. The witch ate and drank everything. She gave the hungry girl a crust of bread and a glass of water. Now listen well, she commanded. Tomorrow, I'm going out early. Sweep the yard in the house, prepare my dinner, do the washing, and when you are finished, sift the wheat. Mind you do it properly and well. Otherwise, Beware. The next morning, Vasilisa awoke and saw from her window that the witch was about to leave. Only a feeble light came from the pickets now. The white horseman plunged across the clearing, and dawn began to brighten the sky. The red horseman came, and the sun rose. At that moment, the forest witch flew off and disappeared among the trees. Left alone, Vasilisa got ready to begin her work. But it was all done. The house was in order, the dinner simmering on the stove, the wash hung out, and the wheat entirely sifted. Vasilisa hugged and thanked her little doll, then hid her safely away once more. In the evening, the girl set the table and waited for the witch. The black horseman galloped by, and night fell. Again, the burning coals on the pickets glowed and cast a shadow-ringed circle of red dish and cast a shadow-ringed circle of reddish light. Branches crackled, leaves whirled, and the forest witch crossed the clearing to enter the house. Is everything ready? she asked. I hope you will be pleased, good mother, replied Vasilisa, curtsying. The witch looked around, sniffed, ate greedily, ate greedily, drank abundantly, and made no complaints before going to bed. She gave orders for the next day. Tomorrow you will do exactly as you did today. Then you will take the poppy seeds in the bin and grind them carefully without losing a single one. Again, I'll just interject in the 1916 version, which is probably more accurate. This has probably been uh, altered a little bit for younger readers. In the 1916 version, when she sifts the wheat, she has to sift out the different colored grains of wheat, which makes it a much more difficult task. It's basically an impossible task. And then in this second day, she has to sort the poppy seeds from the millet seeds or something like that. Again, an impossible task to do in one day for one person with big sacks full of seeds to try and sift them all out one by one. Everything happened as it had the day before. The witch went off, and Vasilisa, finding her work already done, thanked her little doll tenderly. When the witch came back, she asked, 
Is everything done? I hope you will be pleased, good mother, Vasilisa replied, curtsying. The witch sat down satisfied and began to eat. Vasilisa stood by and served her, silent and attentive to her smallest wish. The witch put down her fork and said, Why are you silent, daughter? Talk to me and keep me company. I'd like to ask you a question, if I may, the girl said. Try. There's nothing to be lost by asking, but I do not promise to answer. I wonder about a marvelous, strange thing I saw. When I was coming to your hut, a white horseman on a white horse passed me in the forest. Who is he? He is my dear daylight, the forest witch answered. Just after that, I saw a red horseman on a red horse. Who is he? He's my good son, replied the witch. Then I saw a black horseman on a black horse crossing the clearing. Who is he? He is my blessed shadowy knight. All three are my faithful servants. Thank you, good mother, said Vasilisa, and was silent. The witch looked at her in surprise. You have nothing more to ask me? No, thank you, grandmother. That is all I wanted to know. You're a good girl, Vasilisa. I will give you the fire your sister sent you for. You may go home. Again, there's different versions, but we'll just go with this one here. So saying, the forest witch went out of the house and over to the fence. She took a picket with a burning coal on top, gave it to Vasilisa, and said, Goodbye, Vasilisa, and hurry home before I decide not to let you go. And in the older versions, or in the or another version you can find online, she gets a skull on the end of a picket, and it has the glowing coals in the eye sockets. The young girl, her way lighted by the burning coal, entered the forest. She ran all that night and all the next day. It was evening of the second day before she came within sight of her little house. Her stepmother and her two stepsisters came with open arms to meet her. We're still without fire, Vasilisa. No one could start one. Our neighbors brought us coals, but they went out right away. I hope yours will remain lit. They took the coal inside and put it on the hearth. The fire flamed up, but there was one thing wrong. When the stepmother or her daughters went near the fire, thin flames darted towards their clothing. They had to hop back into the dark to keep from being burned. Disappointed, the stepmother shook her fist and cried, This fire is bewitched. We can no longer live in this house. No, mother, the elder daughter contradicted. We can stay in our house. Chase Vasilisa and her fire out instead. Perhaps, answered the mother, but then we should be without fire, for the witch's fire is the only one that burns in this house. Mother is right, said the youngest daughter. Let us go away where no one knows us, where the witch's fire will not be able to burn us. So, in the uh, version that you can find online, the skull blazes with fire and burns up the mother and the daughters, uh, burns them to, to a crisp, actually. So, this is a a more palatable version, I guess, for children, or at least that's, this is like a 1962 uh, edition that I've got here. And then this is, I think, a 1973 reprint that, I'm, that I received when I was young. The merchant was still on the long trading journey he had begun right after his marriage. He knew nothing of what had gone on. He supposed all was well with his wife and the three girls. During the night, the stepmother and her daughters packed up all they could, linens, jewels, silver, and everything of value, including the pots and pans. They left the house without even waking Vasilisa, who suspected nothing. The next day, Vasilisa found herself alone in the empty house. She put out the magic fire, gathered her few possessions, locked the door, and went to the neighboring village. She met a kindly old woman who asked, Where are you going, my dear? I'm looking for a place to stay until my father returns, answered Vasilisa. Would you like to come home with me, said the good woman? Your company would make me happy. The little old woman's house was very small, but very clean. Vasilisa was happy there. The little old woman felt merrier and younger because of the affectionate, unselfish girl 
who now shared her life. One morning, Vasilisa said, Little mother, it isn't right for me to have so little to do. If you were to buy me some flax, I could spin. The little old woman went to market and bought the best flax she could, and bought the best flax she could find. Vasilisa went to work, and the spun flaxen threads piled beside her as fine as an infant's hair. When the time came to weave it, they found no loom anywhere that was suited to such delicate work. The village carpenter threw up his hands and said that in forty years' experience he still had not learned how to make so fine a loom. In other words, a loom fine enough to handle this thread that Vasilisa had spun. And notice that a loom, as I've talked about on some podcasts in the past, a loom is an extremely common motif in the ancient myths of the world. Just think of the Odyssey. There's looms all over in the Odyssey from start to finish. And they're celestial. So we can identify who Vasilisa is based on all of this. Um, and she encounters the witch. Like I said, the witch lives in a hut that's associated with Ophiuchus. So that should give you an idea of who Vasilisa is. Just before she went to bed, Vasilisa asked the doll's advice. Do not worry. Go to sleep and rest well, said the doll. The next day, the young girl woke to find a faultlessly constructed loom in her room. Joyfully, she started to work. When she had woven a length of cloth, she said, Little mother, if you sell this, the money it will bring may make things easier for you. The old woman examined the cloth in great surprise. Who deserves to buy such fine cloth, my child? Only the czar is worthy of it. Indeed, I'm going to take it to court this very day. She rolled up the lovely stuff, wrapped it in paper, and went to the palace. I've come to speak to the czar, she informed the guard at the gate. First the guard laughed, then he told her to leave. Then, since she insisted, he began to question her. The little old woman answered so well that the guard took her to an officer. The officer took her to the chief of the guards. The chief of the guards took her to the minister, and the minister, not knowing what to do, led her to the czar. <laughs> what do you want, little old woman? The surprised czar asked. Your majesty, she said humbly, I have brought a length of cloth so beautiful that only you seem to me worthy of it. Show me this cloth. The little old woman opened her parcel and carefully unrolled the splendid cloth. Ah, sighed his majesty, yes, it is very beautiful indeed. How much do you want for it? It is priceless, the old woman answered. I brought it to you as a gift. Still more surprised, the czar accepted the cloth and ordered the minister to shower the little old woman with gifts. He summoned the most skillful seamstress in the kingdom and ordered her to make twelve shirts from the cloth. But she and all the other seamstresses at court refused to take on the task. They declared themselves incapable of cutting, to say nothing of stitching, so exceptionally fine a piece of cloth. The czar sent for the little old woman. You knew how to spin and weave this cloth, he said. Surely you can cut it to make twelve shirts. Your majesty, the old woman answered, it was not I who spun and wove your cloth. It was a young girl whom I took into my house. Then return the cloth to her and have her make the shirts, the czar ordered. The little old woman took the cloth and carried it home. As soon as she arrived, she said, Vasilisa, my dear, the czar wants you to make twelve shirts from the cloth. I knew this work would fall to me, the young girl said with a smile. Vasilisa shut herself in her room with her little doll. Together, they cut and sewed twelve shirts so beautiful that they might have been taken for the work of a fairy. The next morning, the little old woman made a parcel of the shirts and delivered them to the czar. Vasilisa put on her coat and hat and sat waiting quietly at the window. <laughs> That's funny. Vasilisa put on her coat and hat and sat waiting quietly at the window. Soon she heard the noise of a carriage. The little old woman was helped out of it by one of the Tsar's own servants. She called out excitedly, Quick, Vasilisa, the Tsar wants to meet the artist 
who is responsible for these splendid shirts. When the Tsar saw Vasilisa, he was overwhelmed by her modest and delicate loveliness. He could only say to her with great sincerity, I want you to be my wife, if you will. The Tsar was a handsome young man, whom it would have been hard to refuse, so Vasilisa gladly accepted. When Vasilisa's father returned from his long trading expedition to faraway places, he was summoned to court. He listened with both sadness and joy to his daughter's adventures. The little old woman came to live in the palace and never lacked for anything she desired. The beautiful Tsarina Vasilisa was now so happy that she never had to turn for comfort to her dear magic doll again. What? Wait a minute. I don't know if that's in the original either. Anyway. So how could this story apply to the situation in the world today? You have some evil, usurping stepmother and stepsisters trying to torment Vasilisa and to take over her rightful home. These are the kinds of people whom the ancient myths and the folk tales that preserve ancient wisdom warn us not to be like. They're greedy and self-absorbed, and their behavior goes against the gods, like the suitors in the Odyssey who want to devour the wealth of a household that is not theirs, and against whom the goddess Athena pronounces judgment, saying, How obscenely they lounge and swagger here. Any man of sense who chanced among them would be outraged seeing such behavior. That's a quotation from Book One of the Odyssey, lines 264 through 267 in the Robert Fagel's translation. The men and women of the United States of America, and indeed the Western world, need to wake up to the fact that wicked usurpers, who parallel the wicked stepmother and sisters of this story, and who also very much parallel the wicked suitors from the Odyssey, have invaded their own household and are behaving just as wickedly as the villains in the ancient stories. They very much want to drive Vasilisa out of her own rightful home and take it over for themselves, just as the suitors in the Odyssey want to take over the house of Odysseus and take its resources for themselves. But those kinds of villains never succeed in the ancient myths or in the folk tales that are preserved down through the ages among the people. In the story of Vasilisa, the powerful witch, who is identified as Baba Yaga in many versions of this folk tale, may seem to be malevolent at first, but in fact, she's representative of powerful elemental forces of the universe itself. See how she describes the horsemen of the morning and the daylight and the night as her faithful servants. And by virtue of her association with the celestial figure of Ophiuchus, she's identified as a liminal figure with one foot in two different realms, one in the realm of earth and one in the realm of heaven, spirit and the infinite. She has no love for the wicked usurping stepmother and stepsisters and sees to it that they're punished in the end. One consistent lesson of the myths and folk tales of the earth is that even the most daunting and seemingly impossible tasks can be accomplished with the right help. In this story, Vasilisa has a doll who tells Vasilisa not to worry, but to let her take care of the doll, which she does even as Vasilisa is sleeping. Although this may seem like something that can only happen in fairy tales, we all, in fact, have access to a power very much akin to what is being dramatized in this story, and which is, in fact, one of the lessons of this story for our life right now. Right now, it may seem like the wicked stepmother and stepsisters are winning, just as it may seem at the beginning of the Odyssey that the suitors are invincible, but just like in the story of Vasilisa, those usurpers are about to get thrown out of the house, which they should hope is what happens to them, since in other versions of the folktale, they get incinerated by the magical fire and burned to a crisp. The good people of the world, from whatever culture, know the difference between right and wrong, and when they notice what is actually going on, 
they consistently reject the kind of evil behavior of the stepsisters and stepmother in this story and their parallel in the world today. But the power of the media is such that many men and women are not even aware of what's going on. So it's well past the time to wake up to the situation. And I hope that this Russian folktale that preserves the ancient wisdom passed down through the generations of the Russian people and yet connected to the myths around the world, myths that unite us all, will help in some small way in that effort in this critical time in the world.